the National Farmers Organization invites you to listen to Farmers' Theory of Marketing. What percent of farmers sell at the top and at the bottom of the market? What industry does in farm marketing? And what is the solution? For more on this information, here's NFO News Analyst Phil Allen. Shelley Robertson is head of the NFO Specialty Commodities Division, and as such, he's involved in a lot of market research. He analyzes the market and talks about the conventional wisdom about when farmers will sell, and he has some observations to make about that, Shelley. What is the farmer's theory of marketing? We have found that every farmer tries to sell 100% of his production at the top of the market, which is a good theory and a, and a good uh, thing to try, but the question that comes to mind is, how do you know when you've hit the top of the market? I don't know, because, uh, well, no one knows when it's the top, do they? They're always trying to guess, uh, when, is it going to go higher? That's right, uh, but they do know, and that's when it falls. So now, all of a sudden, we've discovered that everyone holds to get to the top, recognizes when the top was there, because it's fallen. Then they know, after it starts down. Okay, so now, so? So now we realize that, even though it's good in theory, that in practice, they will never sell on an up market, they always sell on a down market, because they're holding for that high. Phil, do you have any idea how many people, that's farmers collectively through the United States and any commodity, how many actually sell on an up market? I don't know. They're trying to guess when it's going to hit the top, and since nobody knows till it does it, it's probably a pretty small amount. That's correct. Through national surveys, it's been found that the percentage is 3%. And that's a pretty small percentage when you think about it. But the reason you have that 3% is those people, for the most part, have been forced to sell, either through loans that are due or mortgages or whatever, or some other financial crisis has forced them to sell before they were ready to. So even that 3% <laughs> didn't do it by guessing right. They did it because they had to. Because they had to. Well, discussing those percentages, uh, as the market just falls then, since everybody is watching it, what percent do you suppose really sells just after the market has fallen? Well, I suppose then there's the panic element. They'll say, oh, I better sell before it goes lower. Huh? You would think that. You would think it'd be a high percentage immediately after the market is broken. But again, national statistics shows us that it's only 7%. That 90% sell after the market is bottomed. And there's a reason for that when you think about it. The reason is that it takes all the time the market's going down for the farmer to adjust to that price. And by the time he's ready to sell, again, the market's a little lower. So it takes clear to the bottom until it rounds out, bottoms before he can adjust to the price that he can sell for and does sell. Well, then what should they do about this, Shelley? As we stated a moment ago, everyone tries to sell everything they raise at the top of the market. That's at one sale. Doesn't it make sense that if you tried it four, five, or maybe six times, that you might have a better chance of hitting closer to the top than always being that 90% that sell at the bottom? Take just a part of what you have and uh, divide it up into batches and sell it like that, huh? Yes, more orderly marketing, uh, just on averages, would guarantee the person that he's going to at one time sell at a higher place in the market than he does when he tries it one time for his whole production all year. He sees, tries it once and he's got 365 days to wait before he can try his hand at it again. Okay, I follow. Do it four or five times. That'll give you a better chance to hit somewhere where the market's good. But do you mean uh, each one do that individually? Well, yes, they could, but what I really had in mind is all of them doing it together as an organized group. Shelley, since this discussion is all part of a piece, why don't you summarize? We discussed how it is the ambition of every farmer to sell at the top of the market. And yet he only recognized that top after the market had broken and fallen away from that. Only 3% of all farmers through national surveys sell on a rising market. And these people we discovered were those that had to sell. That after the market broke sharply, then, and even then, only 7% sold, and most everybody, or 90%, sold down at the bottom or as it was rounding out. You know, we discussed that this is what farmers do, and we want to get into a discussion on what the trade or industry does, so we can compare the two and see what solution there is to that marketing situation. 
Okay, what are the buyers doing when it's on the rise and very few are selling because they're holding, hoping to go higher? And then what does the industry do when she's on the downswing? As the market's rising, generally the industry will sell contracts. In other words, the trade, and thus the name, uh, they buy and sell, trading a commodity. Uh, they sell on the up market, promising to deliver that, even though they may not have it in their inventory. This is called a short position. Now, they're not fearful of this because they know that the farmer isn't going to sell until after the market breaks and starts down. It panics the farmer and then he sells. This is a practice the industry has done for some time. Now, let's just assume here, Phil, that the market's going up and the industry or the trade sells at various levels here as it rises. And then as it breaks, they pick up a portion of the production they need. You remember only 7% sell it just as it breaks, but they pick up a large portion of it right at the bottom. But they don't pick up enough to fill the contracts they've already made. Are they in trouble? What do they do then? They simply let the market rise again, knowing that farmers will hold even tighter than they did before to try to gain what they lost just previously, and then when it breaks sharply that there is even more selling than there was the time before. This time when the market went up, though, however, they didn't sell. They are going to fill the contracts they're still short on, and they wait till it again breaks, and on the downside, they pick up the production. So in other words, they ran the market up and stripped the production out. They ran the market up and stripped the production out. And they have a term for this. Do you have any idea what it is? What's the term? Well, they call this milking the production from the producer. <laughs> right on. We really shouldn't be critical of the trade for doing this, though. You see, farmers historically have been so unpredictable in their marketing habits that a system has had to be devised to get the production when it's needed by industry. And therefore, they discovered that if you ran a market up, farmers would hold, and if you broke it, they would sell. Now we had a mechanism to get the production when it was needed. So you really can't blame anyone for this system unless you want to blame the farmer because of his unpredictability. Well, what's the solution to all this? There is a solution, and there's a good solution to it, and that's for farmers to organize together and market on a up and a down market. In other words, continue to market together as a informed group, not as individuals. Market little bits of their production at various times during the, whenever the farmers decide, huh? Well, not necessarily when the farmers decide. Uh, they really should have someone that is an expert in the market deciding for them or helping them with it because the natural tendency is, well, why sell now? It's going to get higher. And then they miss the market. So they really need the organized block of the farmer along with the expert that knows markets to encourage them to sell on an up market. Now, Shelley has been explaining uh, some of the theory that farmers use in marketing, some of the things that happen in this market, and I'm going to ask him first to summarize. Uh, we discovered it's the ambition of every farmer to sell at the top of the market. He only recognizes that top, however, when it falls. We discovered that there was 3% only that sold on a rising market, 7 just after it fell, but most everyone, 90%, sold as it bottomed out. And then we discovered how the trade took advantage of this by selling on the up market knowing that they could buy that production on the downside. And if they didn't buy enough, they simply ran it up one more time and bought on the next fall. That we called milking the produce, uh, producers or milking the production from the producers. Now we're ready to see is there a solution to this situation of running the market up and breaking it and getting the production out and holding it and stabilizing it. As the uh, trade sells on the up market, the way to solve that problem is to come in yourself and sell to them while they're selling. And this forces them to make other sales and raise the market. As the market raises, we continue to sell to them until we get to that level that would equal our cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Now a new phenomenon takes place. When we get there, we must all be willing to accept that price, not only for today, but for 30 days, 60 days, 120, on out if that still represents our cost of production plus a reasonable profit. How do we handle it? We do that by saying to the buyer or the trade, look, we will deliver to you under contract 30 days in advance at this price, 60 days into the future at this price, 120 and so on. Now we have floored it and put a stabilizing effect to this ups and downs. No longer does the trade have to milk the production out of the producers to get it when he needs it. No longer does the producer have to take a up and down market to sell his production on 
at below the cost of production figure. Quite frankly, Phil, I cannot think of a better way to raise a market and to stabilize it and solve two problems at one time. Mainly that one of the farmer of cost of production plus reasonable profit, and also that one for the trade of they getting the production when they need it. Okay. It seems to me this is practical and it's efficient. And the NFO has been telling this, this lesson to uh, people in commodities for a long time. What steps do NFO farmers members take to accomplish this, where you have contracts into the future for delivery at a stable price? The steps are very simple. First, if they're not a member, is to become one. Secondly, is to sign a production up and authorize bargainers to sell it in the manner that I've just described. And thirdly, to see that the deliveries are made and those contracts are honored. And that it's not only you do it, but you encourage your neighbor to do it. And that builds the block that you've just referred to. The bigger the block, the more effective. The more effective, the sooner we get the job done. I'm asking this question for people who aren't members of the NFO and may not recognize that there are options. Now, does he have various options when he commits his, his commodity in the NFO block? Yes, he does. Uh, in fact, our programs are so flexible that rather than describe the various options, it's better to say that probably we can tailor things to meet his needs. So that they can get cost of production for a future delivery of contracts. Provided that we get the performance and the participation of enough people. Well, Shelley, are you hopeful that farmers are understanding this point? Yes, I am. The more you talk to the trade and the more periodicals you see published now, are beginning to say what we've said for years, market orderly and market on an up market. That was Shelley Robertson, head of the Specialty Commodities Division of the National Farmers Organization. He outlined the steps farmers and ranchers can take to bring stability by putting their production together in blocks and selling together in orderly stages for delivery at future periods at cost of production plus a reasonable profit. Shelley noted that this benefits both the buyer and the seller. Phil Allen for NFO News, and that for today is something to think about.